Good evening, King's College um, students, ladies and gentlemen. I ask you a very simple question to start, which is, what is your happiest moment? And what is happiness to you? There is a lot of thinking about happiness in history. The Greeks spent a lot of time thinking about um, what happiness means and what drives us, what drives uh, humans, uh, what is the final achievement that uh, human beings um, are aiming for in their lives. For the Greeks, it was about virtue and knowledge. It was about something superior uh, that man should elevate himself to. Aristotle said there was a long-term happiness. There was a mean that you had to follow. Um, and if you deviated from this mean um, into excesses, you would not achieve the real long-term happiness. There is a Greek word called eudaimonia, which is representing this concept, um, the long-term happiness. Over the centuries, the meaning evolved. Um, in the 1300s, Dante wrote the Divine Comedy, and he put Ulysses on a boat uh, at the end of the known world, um, near the pillars of uh, Hercules. And uh, Ulysses was in the hell. Of, uh, in, in one of the circles of hell in the Divine Comedy because he cheated on the Trojans with the horse. But Dante portrays him as a man striving for virtue and knowledge. He says to his sailors, you're not here to live like brutes, like animals. You're aiming at something more. So happiness in the past was something that dependent, depended on you following some superior rules, achieving excellence, meaning, meaning a meaningful life, uh, fulfillment, virtue, purpose. Uh, until more recently, in the 17th and 16th century, we started to think about the individual pursuit of happiness. What if happiness is actually the way I feel? What if I can decide myself whether I'm happy or not? Um, why should we listen to the words of others if happiness is something inside us? So John Locke is the British philosopher that coined the idea of, of uh, coined the, the definition of pursuit of happiness for the first time. But he was still distinguishing bef between um, an imaginary happiness, short term, don't be fooled, and a long term one. If I eat three slices of cake every morning, I may be chasing a lot of short term happiness, but maybe my long term happiness will not be that great. Um, and John Locke was the inspiration for Thomas Jefferson in writing the US Constitution, where for the first time, pursuing individual happiness became a right, a self-evident right of man. And the way you pursue this happiness is entirely up to the individual. Now, with the US Constitution, the start of democracy and later on of um, capitalism, of uh, limited liability companies, of banks lending for future enterprises, uh, of humanity taking risks in enterprises that didn't exist before, crossing oceans or building bridges, democracy and capitalism have built a lot for us um, over the years, over the centuries. But today, if we look back at where we have come and where we are today, when we are now, we see that perhaps something has been lost. Uh, we're in a world where GDP is growing, corporate profits are growing, but this growth has not gone everywhere in the system. Wages are still stagnating. Um, they're basically unchanged um, in the last 30 years. We have a gap between large corporations and individuals. All the GDP that we see is not balanced by a distribution of these gains across the population. We have uh, European growth uh, back towards 2 percent this year, but youth unemployment still in the double digits. We have the highest record, uh, the highest level of inequality in this country, where uh, the top 1% generates one-third of income, uh, but one-third of children live in poverty or near the poverty line. And we have a decreasing amount, a decreasing level of social mobility. Uh, millennials, people born after the 1980s, of which I'm part of, are often criticized for being lazy. 
Now, they say we like bean bags and froyo, um, and we are entitled. But the reality is that social mobility has gone down together with rising inequality. And they go hand in hand. If you have inequality, you'll have um, two different sets of people sending their children to different schools, and inequality perpetuates over time. In 1940, a child would have a very high chance of doing better than their parents. Almost, almost for sure you would do better, no matter what. Even if you were doing bad at school, uh, you wouldn't get good grades. Because of growth, you would get raises, you would do better. Over time, the hope, the percentage, the chance of doing better than your parents did has gone down. Today, the first, for the first time in post-war history, the young generation has less than 50% uh, probability of doing better than their parents. We are the first generation of being poorer than our parents. The lottery of life, the postcode where you were born, <coughs> explains around 80% in the United States, explains around 80% around of the income you will generate during your life. Schools are more expensive, Wages are lower, education is more expensive, healthcare is more expensive. How did we get here? How did we go from a concept, the pursuit of happiness, which was entirely right and reasonable, to the growth of capitalism, financial markets, uh, banks, um, to where we are today, where perhaps we have an excess, we have deviated from the mean, from long-term happiness, and we have lost the functioning of some of our um, economic model. Well, if we think about the world today, we can start from the post-war period. We can think about what happened after World War II. It all started with a dream. We'll talk about a dream today. We'll talk about how the dream turned into greed and fear. The dream was about freedom, opportunity, democracy, private enterprise, how to give you the chance to be happy as an individual. Following the economic disaster and the human tragedy of World War II, there was a very fast decade, actually two decades of growth. Initially, there was a lot of demand for goods from Europe and Japan. Um, that was the reconstruction. Europe and Japan were uh, importing US goods. The US was growing, there was a boom. Elvis was talking about ambition. Um, the, the, there was a boom in almost every sector. You would make more money. Imagine having a raise every year, every six months, just because you're in the right time and the right place. But then at some point, there was a slowdown. Uh, there was the Vietnam War. Um, the US started to slow. Uh, there was more inflation, higher debt, uh, the Cold War with Russia, and politicians have had to come up with something. At the same time, uh, people wanted a bigger share of the pie of rights. People who had fought in the wars um, wanted um, the right to vote, the right to welfare, the right to health care. And this meant more money for the government. So something had to be invented to come up with a solution. And this solution was the Nixon shock, it was the American dream. It was a hand from Uncle Sam. If you couldn't afford your house, your uh, university tuition, your car, you would get a hand in the form of a loan from the government. So instead of uh, having a mortgage from a bank, your mortgage would be issued and then parceled and securitized by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac and then sold to investors at a much lower yield for a saving uh, on your interest. And that was the first part, but unfortunately what this also meant was that households over time started to take more and more debt. It wasn't a problem though, because populations were growing, so in the future you have more people paying for that debt. Technology was inflationary, so everyone was buying one or two cars. Bad for the environment, but more inflationary. So you would have inflation reducing the debt tomorrow. And that's how the generation of the 1950s, 60s, and 70s started the debt super cycle. 
The debt super cycle was helped by uh, other institutions. Um, private debt started to grow. Um, the business cycle became more fragile, and the business cycle and the financial cycle started to go hand in hand. People became more sensitive to their mortgage payments. So in a slowdown, you as a central bank needed to lower the payment, lower the interest rate to kick that can of debt forward. Um, an alternative to this was to deregulate the supply of credit. So abolishing reserve requirements on banks, reducing capital requirements, um, reducing the big bank in London, opening the city. Deregulation and lower interest rate accompanied this debt party. At some point, the um, stimulus from the government became a big party in financial markets with the growth of the high yield market, the growth of M&A, and Gordon Gekko from a villain became a hero, which you see here. Central bankers became influenced by the philosophy of Ian Rand, who was the extremization of capitalism and individual um, uh, achievements. Adam Smith talked about capitalism and created, you know, created liberal economics, discussing, discussing competition as a force for good. If you have people competing with each other, what they do becomes better. They make more effort and it increases the quality of, pro of products. It increases productivity. That was Adam Smith's goal, to improve the common production in an economy based on competition. Ian Rand says it doesn't matter. Um, I compete because I want to win. And if I win, I make more money, I'm better, and no one can make me feel guilty for that. What happened after this is history. There was too much debt. Um, we had a tip of the pyramid of debt, which was US subprime, which was $2.4 trillion. And that started to bring down the castle of cards and created a balance sheet recession across different countries in the world, uh, engulfing economies until today. Central bankers came to the rescue as white knights and became heroes in the crisis, as you can see there. But what we know today is that things have not gone really back to normal. There are still some collateral effects in the economy. We are back to normal in terms of GDP and in terms of unemployment in some countries, but the haves and the have-nots are at very different places. People in Manchester or Liverpool are in at very different levels of wealth and opportunity compared to people in London. Um, and Today, we also see that in markets, in financial markets, some assets are starting to go into a, a very parabolic um, trajectory. And these are assets which suggest that people want to hoard money in, um, in, in anything that gives you safety. They suggest that perhaps, perhaps there's less faith uh, in central bankers and, and in the traditional economic system should a crisis come back in the next few years. So how did we go from how did we go from the American dream to greed? We go into the 80s. We talk about this guy. Um, how did we get to believe that greed is good? And this was true until 2008. We can show you here the chart uh, that's probably one of the most important I'll show you. It's the super cycle of private debt. The policies that were started uh, in the 60s and 70s, allowing, you, allowing first people in the US and then in other countries to um, borrow more easily through a subsidy by the government, these policies created an exponential growth of credit. Uh, the green area is GDP in the US. The yellow is private debt in the US. It started with Fannie and Freddie, but then it became a very popular trick for politicians to give you a loan. Think about the last UK government. What did they do? Anyone has an answer? What did they do in five years? One of the things they did was the help to buy. There's not enough houses in the UK. It's very expensive to buy one. So what you do is to help people to take more debt. So you basically increase the price of existing houses rather than building new ones. It's a subsidy. Uh, the same was happening in Brazil. And it's exactly the same thing that has created this mountain of debt, which is now around 3.5 times GDP. So the financial system has become bigger from being roughly the same size, has become bigger than, than our economies. 
What this means is that today we live in an environment where we have a financial system that doesn't serve our economy any longer. We have an economy that in some cases is serving the financial system when there is a crisis. China did the same in the last 10 years when the US was deleveraging. China doubled total social financing. Europe also did the same. You can see the blue line up there um, during the Eurozone unification. European banks are now one of the largest banks in the world. Together with this, we had a um, loose monetary environment by central bankers. This is a chart showing you interest rates for the last 3,000 years. They've never been lower. And in some cases, as you know, with quantitative easing, central bankers have pushed interest rates to negative uh, levels. And they've started, not happy with that, they've started buying assets. Who, who of you has watched the last Star Wars movie? Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, so like 50, 40, 50 percent. So this is the, it was a pretty expensive movie, lots of special effects, and this is the cost of Star Wars. This is the European Stability Mechanism, which is 500 billion euros. It's the International Monetary Fund of Europe. This is the hedge fund industry, uh, or UK GDP. This is the Iraq-US war cost over the years. This is the amount of gold in the world. This is Eurozone GDP, and this is European banks, to give an idea. So 31 trillion, three times GDP. Effectively, during the 80s until the 2008 crisis, there was a debt party, the debt super cycle continued to grow, accompanied by central bankers who believed bubbles shouldn't be um, cared about, because you could only recognize them after they pop, so let's not even try. And this is a chart from the Bank for International Settlements, which shows you the size of the swings in the financial system, the blue line versus the red line, which is the swings in the business cycle. What policymakers tried to do effectively is to stabilize the business cycle, which became less and less volatile over time, using credit, using interest rates. At any crisis, you would lower interest rates to stimulate the economy, um, get people more debt, help to buy, so you get voted again. And then, by doing so, you would build a bigger, bigger financial system and financial, and financial swings. Now, why everybody in the room, almost uh, everybody in the room, has only seen house prices going up? It's because the financial cycle can be kicked a lot more forward in the future than the business cycle. There is a slowdown or a recession every five, seven, ten years, but the financial cycle can, can last for 30, 40 years. Today, what we have realized with the financial crisis is that the financial system may be too big for us to manage. And what we're trying to do is to reduce the volatility of the financial system, to uh, bring banks to higher capital levels, uh, to um, reduce the risk taking, and to basically reduce the swings in the blue line, which is the detrended swings in the financial system. But by doing that, we see that the red line is dead. There's no more growth, there's no more inflation. So what we thought was a machine of perpetual motion, so giving credit, issuing credit every time there's a recession, um, is no longer a machine of perpetual motion. We, can't, we can no longer cut interest rates or give, or give more credit to people. We have to deleverage, we have to restructure our financial system and the way we think about policy decisions in fiscal policy and monetary policy. The problem is that we are stuck in a trap because the, the more I keep interest rates low, by the way, there is some good news at the end, don't worry. <laughs> the more I keep interest rates low, the more I create collateral effects. So now let's think about this for a moment. Like I keep low interest rates. In theory, low interest rates are supposed to give you a boost because you can buy a house more easily, right? But then if you are in an aging population environment, like let's say some countries in Europe, you actually also earn less on your savings. So if interest rates go down immediately, you, you may be happy, you get a mortgage, you buy a house, but then you realize that your earnings or your pension is going to yield less, so you actually need to save more. You actually may have a contrarian effect. You may actually end up doing the opposite that central bankers want you to do. Also, in lowering interest rates, I'm boosting, central banks are boosting asset prices. But who owns the assets? Only a very small amount of assets are owned by people that are below 45 years of age. So the haves are older or people in large cities with 
good jobs, and the have-nots are everyone else. So you create inequality. You also keep zombies alive. The zombies in Europe are, for example, the banks. There's over 6,000 banks. In Italy and Spain, there's more bank branches than pizza restaurants per person, more than pharmacies or schools. And uh, in, you keep corporates alive that should restructure, companies that otherwise would have to um, do something different. Think about this for a moment. Um, you have a company that manufactures something in the most inefficient way possible, but they already exist, they can fund at uh, 1% and they use workers instead of robots. So today, they keep these people in, in their jobs and, it, and that's good, but long term you continue to perpetuate an inefficient business model. So you also keep people in, in jobs for 10 or 20 years that potentially could, could learn something new. So you, re you misallocate resources. How many people have been working around the property market in the UK, for example? Um, you also create asset bubbles. Asset bubbles in markets. There are some <coughs> examples. Collectibles, art, the Leonardo painting uh, that was sold for several hundred million dollars. Bitcoin. Um, all these things can create a boom-bust cycle. So I get some growth today, but then I'm stuck in a trap and I can create, I can reduce my, low, my, my potential growth in the future. So what do I do? Well, there are two ways to get out of it. The current situation is to do more QE. Unfortunately, QE1 works very well. QE1 is, has generated some shock and awe. It's a bit like first love when you go with your first girlfriend. Um, there's a lot of new things you discover. But then, then at some point it all peters out and um, uh, you know, if with politicians not doing anything, um, central banks did QE2, which is going back with your ex-girlfriend. And that's not very nice. You know something's not working. It's not going to last very long, but you can still try. And then there's QE3, QE4, QE5, until QE infinity, which is getting married with your ex-girlfriend. I'm sorry if you are not laughing. <laughs> I feel sorry for you. But apart from QE infinity, you have a couple of ways to get out of this. The good way is to do reforms in fiscal policy. So you actually get politicians to do their work and to care about long-term growth. And that's very hard because politicians just want to be re-elected in three, four, five years time. So they'd rather give you another help to buy, to buy that expensive flat that is uh, falling apart, uh, rather than doing the reforms, investing in education, inequality, and so on. There is also a bad situation, which is populism and um, taking a shortcut effectively um, instead of doing the right reforms uh, and the long term, chasing the long term goals, uh, inequality and some of these collateral effects provide fertile territory for um, extreme views in the political sphere. Nationalism, militarism, protectionism, blaming the immigrants, blaming Mexico, blaming Europe, um, and so on. And this is neither bad for the long term growth of a country uh, nor for investors. What we have achieved is saving us, QE has saved us from having a deep recession. Obviously we're better off with QE than having not done it, but it has also come with a cost. And this cost we have underestimated for a long time. And the cost is to have a lower potential growth trajectory in the future and these collateral effects, which is why today after dreams and greed, we live in an age of potential fear. We live in an age of crossroads between having to make some decisions to reform our economy and financial system or to be captured by some of the extreme views that we see around uh, the different policy decisions available and the different parties that are proposing them. It's very clear that today Whoever is young and studying here or getting into the job market is going to have a very different future from what our uh, former generations thought about. You know, the idea that you would just go to school, get a degree, buy a house, and then 
um, get a job and do well in your life is gone. The social contract of um, doing, working hard, getting to university uh, is gone. You're actually going to have to find out something new. The world is changing in a very um, abrupt way. And what we're trying to do as long-term investors is to understand whether these are orderly rebalancings or abrupt uh, revolutions. There's changing, um, there's changing technology. Automation, artificial intelligence will mean that some workers will compete with robots. But this will also mean that a lot of people will be out of their jobs and um, the people that program the robots will be much better off. Income and jobs and opportunity will polarize. This will mean more polarized um, wealth, more inequality, polarized politics, which we are already seeing. Trump, Brexit, uh, and various movements in Europe are continuing to, to be examples. Politicians will react, sometimes will react with shortened boosts to growth. Universal basic income, building a wall, um, protectionism. Other times they will react with long-term uh, solutions. And Central bankers so far have reacted by kicking the can even longer. They are trying to withdraw stimulus, but they're not doing it fast enough to build a buffer for the next crisis. And if that wasn't enough, we also have the effects of weather polarization. So polarization is not just a political and economic phenomenon in income and wealth. It's also uh, an effect. Um, it also has an effect on weather and extreme events, which in turn generate more geopolitical risk. The truth is that if we look at the future, many of the paradigms that have um, you, that we have used to think about economics and technology and society are no longer applicable. You know, we used to learn economics at school, and I don't know if you still learn the same stuff, but uh, in terms of efficient markets and rational behavior and growing populations, uh, the reality is that we know today that markets are not efficient, populations are aging. Um, you cannot print your way out of a recession and generate inflation because you can get into a balance sheet recession. You cannot spend your way out of a recession because you have less people paying for the debt in the future. Technology will not necessarily boost productivity in the near term and inflation. The, the, the search for progress that has powered capitalism and democracy still works, but in the near term it can create disruption, misallocation, of, um, of people from jobs that are being disrupted um, into other jobs or into unemployment. This reduces inflation. People compete with robots. Robots are paid three, four dollars per hour. Um, the Phillips curve no longer works. Politics are becoming more uh, polarized. Politicians are no longer as rash as, well, they're less rational even than they were before. Geopolitics is becoming driven not by America being the policeman of the world, by, but by a multipolar equilibrium with China being uh, a large part. Fiscal policy, the trickle-down effect, which people believed in the past, um, is no longer happening. 0.1% top earners in the UK generate 16% of taxable income. 1% generates one-third, but one-third of children live near the poverty line. One third of people, nobles mostly in the UK, own one third of the land. 7% of privately educated people are 50% or over journalists, uh, top judges and MPs. And 50% of CEOs come from three high schools. I don't see a trickle down effect. Monetary policy also needs to be revised. It used to be that low interest rates today would generate growth and, low, and higher interest rates in the future. But if low interest rates today create asset bubbles that can burst in the future, then I may actually need to keep interest rates low tomorrow as well. So let's have a look at these rebalancings of revolutions, one by one. The first is technology, mo the most interesting one, potentially. 100 years ago, we came from a world where you used to have a lot of white collar workers, well, a lot of blue collar workers, a lot of, and a few white collar workers. Then we had the automation a revolution. We started to have more creative workers, um, less blue collar workers, um, and robots and machines automated the, rep the most repetitive jobs um, for humans. What we have today is a bit different. Uh, we can automate more and we can automate even the white collar jobs. So we'll have a growth in creative jobs, but perhaps this overall may be a jobless growth with less 
people working and more machines. Which means in the beginning there will be some disruption. There is around 50, many of the, um, according to new estimates, many of the current jobs in uh, services, accounting, finance, even portfolio management may be automated. Which is why I'm trying to do public speaking. <laughs> <laughs> what this means is inequality. Inequality um, is not just the rich and the poor. Inequality is also geographical. Technology is a driver. Globalization is always blamed. Um, there is inequality of wages and income, but there is also inequality of uh, health care, education. Um, QE has contributed to inequality. Uh, there is inequality across generations. There is inequality across geographies. Inequality can be so big that at some point a very small group of people may end up manipulating the opinions of others and influencing the outcome of elections or a referendum, for example. Today, only 5% of wealth, financial assets, is owned by people below 35 years of age. 15% only is owned by people below 45 years of age. So when the central banks call for a wealth effect, they are really helping everyone who's over 45. Geographically, what we see is that Europe, in particular, but also in the US, we're starting to see an environment where we can talk about divided states or, divi or a divided kingdom, where London is 20% of GDP, um, where you know, people in the north are facing much tougher um, prospects. Uh, the red line is low growth, low, low uh, wealth, uh, where inequalities continue to be boosted by um, policies that um, help uh, exporters or help financial centers. Uh, they don't help the real economy. Inequality is also a corporate phenomenon. Think about Apple, Google, you know, how many of you have an iPhone? Apple, Google, Facebook have paid something, in, in some years have paid something around 50 euros of tax for 100 million of revenues in Europe. Um, as you make life easier for companies by lowering funding costs and uh, lowering the cost of uh, issuing bonds and equity, you also make it easier for these companies to buy smaller ones. Smaller companies are the ones that generate the most jobs. You know, every inventor, every entrepreneur started with something small. Today, what's happening is that they are bought out in the early stage, maybe for a lot of money, 100 million, 200 million. Every one of you probably dreams of doing a startup, uh, which is what I was do gonna do at university before going into finance, bad idea. But um, if that happens, then what it means is that these small companies get absorbed by larger conglomerates which are less efficient. So inequality has reduced uh, the long-term neutral interest rates of economies similar to long-term growth rates by around half a percent. But the danger is not just that. The danger is that with high inequality you have um, dis a disruption in, in politics um, and not just domestically but also internationally. The number of democracies in the world is shrinking. This is the Economist Intelligence Unit data. The United States has recently been downgraded from a full democracy to a flawed democracy. <laughs> that was last year. Is the UK a full democracy still? Don't be too comfortable. And finally, weather events. Geopolitical risk is also driven by the fact that we have treated our world also with a pursuit for short-term happiness, for short-term growth. And, you know, um, for those who don't believe in climate change, you can look at this chart. And, you know, it's not just having 40 degrees under zero in New York and 40 degrees above in Australia, but it is also droughts and earthquakes in many countries which, which push populations to migrate. And a lack of resources which pushes conflict internationally. Finally, there is what we look at the most in financial markets. For the ones that live here, finance is very close. And so we think about QE and asset bubbles. And it took us around a day to make this chart. Um, I didn't do it. Um, but uh, when you start with QE, you push people into buying assets that are riskier than government bonds. So imagine a pyramid 
Central banks buy the government bonds. There's around 7, 8 trillion of government bonds with near zero yield or very low yield. So after you bought those, they don't yield anything else. You move into something else. Investment grade debt, high yield bonds. There's another 6, 7 trillion of them very close to 1 or 2% yield. And after you do that, what investors have come up with is strategies to bet that the world tomorrow is going to be the same as the world today. Selling volatility, selling bets that uh, pay you only if markets continue to trade in the same range. And there's around 2 trillion of that. <coughs> so the pyramid of potential assets and bubbles and overvalued assets, depending at the bottom of, of central banks, has been growing and growing. And here's Bitcoin, for the ones who were wondering. So what does this all mean? It means that if we look at this chart, potentially we're heading, in a tough, we're heading towards a tough period. We're heading towards a period where when growth will decelerate at some point in the coming years, for now we're enjoying the aftermath of QE and, the, and the, we're still in the party of QE. We still have growing debt. But when growth will slow down, uh, what we see in history is that every experiment, every, every um, <coughs> time money was debased, um, that was accompanied by a, an economic and social crisis. This is the consumer price index. So when it spikes up, it means your money is worth less. The first people who had the idea of shaving money were in the Roman Empire around uh, the late Roman Empire, where um, the empire was being split and they started to pay soldiers with shaved silver and, and bronze coins. Then soldiers realized that they were worth less and they were not paid enough. Some of them deserted. And this came together with the, um, with the gradual uh, disruption of, of the empire. Um, Henry, uh, King Henry VII, I believe, was uh, shaving silver coins to fund wars in France uh, in the 1500s. And similarly, during World War I and World War II, governments were funding themselves with bonds. Um, by depreciating their currency, pushing inflation, double-digit inflation rates on bondholders who effectively were getting paid a negative, in, a negative real interest rate. Today, central banks have bought 20 trillion in assets globally. They have not depreciated currencies, they're all doing it together. So the dollar is not depreciating against the euro so much or the euro against the yen because all the central banks are buying assets. But by buying all assets, they are depreciating the value of money across the world. This is perhaps the biggest monetary debasement experiment in history. But it has been done in peacetime. Now, it's not all bad. And when we look at the future, um, I want to think about solutions. Um, and I think that policymakers have around a window of around three to five years to achieve some of these solutions. There's a lot of things that are discussed today um, about Europe uh, and about the UK and about how to rebalance the um, damage from the crisis. Some of them are just bad ideas. <coughs> you know, they don't fly with anyone who looks at the data. Like, you know, building the wall, exiting from NAFTA, America first. Some of these things are just slogans aimed at recreating um, the environment uh, of the 70s. You know, America first, let's go back to an industrialized country of the 1970s. Uh, it's not going to happen. You cannot rewind technology. You know, take back control, same thing. Uh, exiting the euro, QE for the people. Some of these things look only at the short-term impact, not at the long-term collateral effects. Then there is other things which are Okay, they don't have long-term negative effects, but they also don't solve the long-term problems. For example, universal basic income. It's interesting. I do need to give people a floor. Um, there's thousands of homeless people in the UK. Many of them are veterans who fought in the wars. Um, you need universal basic income, but it doesn't mean that these people will have social mobility. It doesn't mean they will have access to education, to training, to get a job. It just makes them less of a visible problem. So it is a patch solution. It doesn't solve the problem. And then there is some good stuff that's being discussed, but not enough. Things like labor market reforms, um, uh, you know, free universities, scholarships, uh, retraining of workers. In Australia, for example, there was a mining boom. 
um, following China's growth. And today, miners are being retrained for free into other jobs. But it's one of the few countries that it's doing it. So here's, I think, what could actually help. Um, if we think about the public sector, what we need is to focus on long-term growth, on long-term um, productivity. The UK has one of the lowest productivity rates um, because of the lack of investment in, in, in long-term um, uh, education and research. Um, correcting entitlements. The idea that you would go and retire at 60 and future generations would pay for you no longer works if, if life expectancy is growing. Reforming the financial system, introducing more flexible debt. This has already been done for banks. Banks can now fund uh, with flexible capital that in a crisis gets written down. Investors can take the risk, at least we can, uh, and um, manage it. Um, if you do not have a flexible debt system, then whenever there's a crisis, the central bank will have to lower the interest rates for everyone else to save, to save one industry or one sector, especially when it comes from banks. Tax reform, rebalancing the burden from income to assets. Uh, there is very, um, there, there's, there's very strong accumulation of assets, which comes with inequality and very high taxes on income. This reduces social mobility. It's something that um, needs to be solved. The UK is one of the lowest um, tax rates on properties, around 0.1% against 1 or 1.5% in other countries. Why this is never corrected? Well, you know, the official story is putting a 70-year-old pensioner widow as human shield. Oh, I have this lady and she's inherited so much property and if I tax her, she's not going to pay her bills. Um, the reality is that uh, the country is still controlled by landlords in large part. Private sector can help to retrain people to consolidate, uh, to, to consolidate the banking system and to revalue the stakeholder capitalist model. Stakeholder capitalism cares about everyone, not just shareholders. Cares about creditors, cares about employees, cares about the supply chain. And that's something that I'm sure you learn in this business school. But we also need not just the public and the private sector to, to, um, to reform themselves. We also need central bankers to think about something um, long term. Very often central bankers have been um, chased uh, as the white knights during a crisis. What's the easiest and quickest thing we can we, that we can do? Lower interest rates, Q1, Q2, Q3. The truth is that these things yield long-term problems. And we have seen that they have collateral effects and they create addiction in an economy. So monetary policy reform, which has been called in some countries, including Iceland, says that when you um, lower interest rates today, you actually need to have financial stability as your core mandate, not as a side game, and think about the potential future impact of your loose policy today when you do it. Similarly, having commercial banks as um, uncontrolled creators of credit also creates a risk. In an environment where I can deregulate commercial banks, even if the central bank hikes interest rates, deregulation can still help central ba commercial banks to create credit. This is what was happening in the late 2000s, in the mid-2000s, before the crisis happened. Even though the central bank was hiking rates, commercial banks continued to issue CDO, CDO squared, and so on. For Europe, paradoxically, I have more hopes. The neoliberal model of capitalism that was very successful in the US and the UK to generate growth is perhaps the, more, the most extreme. extreme. Europe has been criticized a lot for being behind, um, for being slow, uh, for being you know, neither meat nor fish. But Europe has also a more stable welfare model, which has allowed it to be more balanced, more equal. It has generated less growth, but more equal growth. Um, Europe has less inequality. And in Europe, neither Trump nor Brexit or similar policies have won yet. So Europe needs some measures to become stronger in the next three, four years. But I think Europe is perhaps one of the few areas where these measures may happen. So reducing, and some of them are already happening, reducing youth unemployment, uh, creating fiscal transfers across countries, um, rebalancing the debt burdens across countries, 
um, creating a common budget. Uh, with these things in mind, I think Europe, perhaps because there are some technocrats which are not elected, therefore they don't worry about being re-elected, is one of the few areas of the world that thinks about the long term. So even though a lot of the UK press has criticized Brussels, it can be sometimes an asset to have people that work for you that don't need to be re-elected in five years, because they can focus on the long term. So I said I would talk about some hope. Um, the reality is that after the Berlin Wall fell, someone said, communism has failed but capitalism has not won. Capitalism hasn't failed yet. Capitalism has generated a lot of resources, but has failed to redistribute them. And especially the neoliberal policies associated with the trickle down, uh, the debt super cycle and the debt subsidies that we have seen coming from the US and the UK. But also capitalism and democracy remain the best model that we still have. <coughs> Even though you can blame globalization um, and capitalism, uh, you still see that poverty has been reduced, uh, that um, education has grown globally, that child mortality has gone down, and that um, the level of um, uh, poverty and literacy has improved. So I want to leave you with this um, picture. We go back to Ulysses. This time is in a different adventure. He's sailing uh, and trying to dodge the danger of the sirens. Now the sirens are an attraction for every sailor, which I am and I'm trying every day to stay clear, but um, they represent temptation, so short-term gain. Today, what we have seen is that a lot of policymakers and sometimes ourselves have deviated from the mean, what Aristotle was thinking about as long-term happiness. What Ulysses does here is to tie himself to the mast and wax his ears to stay away from this short-term temptation and follow the long-term path. This is a common problem in economics, time and consistency. Policymakers very often chase something which is um, positive in the short term, but bad in the long term. A central bank wants to cut rates because they want to save the economy today. A government wants to do another help to buy because they want to be re-elected. What we need to do is to focus on the long term policies and the long term happiness rather than deviating from the path and giving our path to the Syrians. In times of uh, crisis, we need to keep this in mind. Some people um, chase, uh, some people give up to fear, to populism, to the shortcuts, to uh, the Euro exit, to the Brexit, to the Trumps. Other people um, believe in hope and in long term reforms, which is what I do. So my wish today is that this has been useful and that you will choose the latter and not fear. Thank you.